All right. We good? I'm good. Woo! I had to, I had to gather myself down there. That was, that was good stuff. Um, I, I want to share this story. First of all, I'm Aaron. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, pastor over small groups. Uh, John and Kelly are out on some much needed vacation and, and we just pray blessings and rest over them as they are getting rejuvenated. So we bless them. I want to tell this story real quick and then we'll, we'll move on. I haven't forgotten about anything yet. So uh, yeah, I haven't forgot. Um, so this, um, this, this professor at this, uh, theolo- uh, this uh, seminary had some young students this is way back when, about 1940-ish, had some young students and, I'll try to keep that there, there we go, that's better, um, had some students and, and they were traveling around and they were going to visit different significant places across the world. And they went to England and they went to this, this, this man's house, they actually went to John Wesley's house, John Wesley who ended up starting the, the Methodist church. Um, moved in crazy signs and wonders. I mean, just amazing stuff. And so they go in and they're in this, they're in this, in John Wesley's house. And uh, by the way, you may have heard this story before, but sorry, that's what we're doing. Um, so <clears throat> they're in this man's house and they're in his bedroom and they look uh, by the bed and there's two worn spots beside the bed. And the, the professor goes on to talk about how uh, you know, that John Wesley would kneel there and pray for hours, crying out for revival, crying out for revival, crying out for revival. For hours, he would pray. And so they get done and, and they leave and, and they go to get on their bus and, and um, the guy's, you know, doing a head count as you would. And he's, he's, he's one short. He's one kid short. He's like, who in the world? Like, oh my gosh, guys, we have one job to do. So he runs in. I'm adding a little commentary, what I would be thinking. So he goes back into the house and he, he's looking all around and he goes into the bedroom and there's one of his students kneel down in that same spot praying. Whew. Do it one more time. Lord, do it one more time. That's my cry today. I, I was talking to Shannon this morning. I don't use the word revival. I can't get away from that word. Do it one more time. So the man walked over and told his student, we, it's time to go. And Billy Graham stood up and got on the bus. I don't know. My son just did a wax museum where he was Billy Graham. And I don't know if you've ever heard his stats, but I'm going to try to remember them. Two billion people have heard him preach. 215 million people showed up to watch him preach live. 2.2 million people that they know of will be in heaven because of Billy Graham. All because, and I don't know if you've ever watched any of those videos of Billy Graham. The guy's not, I mean, he's not, a. forgive me for being human for just a moment. He's not an amazing speaker or orator. He's just, he's just speaking the word, but the Holy Spirit inside of Billy Graham has 2.2, probably more million people that came to know Jesus because he was just devoted. And he knew that all he could do was all he could do, but the Holy Spirit in him and through him could accomplish more than he could ever accomplish. And that's what I'm praying for today. I have a message. I don't know if I'll get there, so we'll just see. I waited for five, six because, because I wanted them to hear that story. Because you're in the fifth and sixth grade, but you can start today. You can start, you have a calling and a purpose. This goes for everybody in the room. You have a calling and a purpose on your life right now, not for later, but it starts right now. God is calling out to you right now to step into who he's created you to be. And you don't have to be anybody but who he's created you to be but we are called to be who he has created us to be. And when we step into that, I mean, the world changes. The world changes. 185, I think 185 different countries he preached in. That's crazy. So on that note, five fifth and sixth graders, if you want to make your way out, let's clap them out. Let's encourage them as they go to learn about their purpose. And while we're clapping, let's welcome everybody online. Thank you guys for joining us. Woo, man. I told the worship team 30 minutes and they looked at me like, really? 
I'm like, yeah, just come on out. I mean, we might go another 20 minutes. It's fine. Um, I'm just kidding. I only have 55 minutes planned. So that was a joke. I know it's funnier if I don't have to explain it. So I need to work on my jokes. So we're in this series called King Jesus. And this is going to be a final day. I'm going to recap that here in a minute. But next Sunday, you, you don't want to miss next Sunday. Next Sunday is Celebration Sunday. It's going to be baptisms. We're doing baby dedications. We're doing senior recognition. We're, uh, we've got all kinds of stuff going on next Sunday. You do not want, if you've never been to a baptism service or a baby dedication service, it's the, it's the reason we do what we do. It is the reason we do what we do. It's the reason why we all, not we, we all do what we do. It is Celebration Sunday. You do not want to miss it. It is so powerful. And if you want to be baptized or you have a baby that you would like to dedicate or you have a senior that you would like to recognize, uh, you can sign up for that online uh, in events, I believe is where that is. So that's next Sunday, okay? Don't miss it. You want to come back. Forget, you know, if, if what I have to say is you're like, eh, next week it's great. Come back next week. <laughs> so we started this series off on Good Friday. How many, here were, 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 how many of you were here for Good Friday service? How many of you would say, oh my gosh, I mean, that's all I could talk about for hours. Like it was the most powerful thing. And they didn't, they didn't tell me what was going to go on. So it was a surprise for me too. I was like, this is amazing. Um, we started with Good Friday with his crucifixion. His crucifixion, his blood. Let me back up. Let me slow down, Aaron, slow down. Nothing, the, the full promise of God, we don't get without all of these things of what I'm about to describe. But I believe each one of them had a significant purpose. The crucifixion was his sacrifice. His blood cleansed us of our sin. And then on Easter Sunday, we, we did Resurrection Sunday. And that was Jesus defeating death. He was being risen from the dead so that we could rise from the dead as well and live with him in eternal life forever and ever and ever and ever in perfection. That's what heaven is. It's perfection. No more crying, no more pain, no more sickness, no more disease. Forever. That's Resurrection Sunday. Today, the ascension. We're going to talk about the ascension. And I'm going to ruin this whole message for you because I'm going to tell you the point right at the beginning. Here we go. I'm going to read it. It's in John 16, 7 and 8. I think we're going to have it up there. Is it up there? Yep, it's up there. Nevertheless, you'll have to go back and read. I'm going to give you lots of homework today, by the way. You're going to have to go back and read, nevertheless, to see why it's there. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, meaning the Holy Spirit. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. That's why God, that's why Jesus had to ascend to heaven so that the Holy Spirit could come. I'm done. That's it. We're going to talk about more, but that's, that's why he had to go because his friends were sad. They did not want him to leave. And he's like, no, no, no. It's better if I go, if it's better if I go, because then I get to send the helper. Because we're going to see here in a little bit that by getting the helper, by getting the Holy Spirit, by being here now, Jesus is in King Jesus. We're going to see. He is sitting on his throne. And him being there, seated on his throne, sending the helper to all of us, that's where we find our purpose. That's why we're here. I heard somebody say that if, if the goal of ministry was just to get people saved and get them to heaven, then you only need two ministries, evangelist and assassin. Get them saved and shoot them and they're there but we're here it's not my joke see they're always funnier when they're not my jokes that's why we're here we're here because we have purpose and calling so we're going to be in Luke 24 Mark 16 and Acts chapter 1 we're going to do a lot of reading today and then I'm going to tie it all together at the end so if you have your Bibles Luke 24 that's where we're going to be first then Mark 16 then Acts chapter 1 all right, here we go. Luke chapter 24. He told them, let me back up. Uh, he, he has come to them. Um, he, he's presenting himself. He's revealing himself to the 11 after he has been risen 
from the dead. Okay, so he's, he is showing himself. All right. He told them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures because they were in unbelief. They were having a lack of faith because... And that moment, he's like, I've already told you these things, but you didn't understand. So you need to understand. Let me help you understand. Let's pray for that right now. Can we do that? Heavenly Father, right now in this moment, would you open our minds to understand the scriptures in a new, more powerful way? Would you let us see that the scriptures point to you? Amen. Now, if we have faith about that, we'll start reading more because faith requires action. We'll get there. It's fine. Faith requires action. Okay. Okay. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead the third day and repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Here we go. Verse 49. And look, I am sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. Then he led them out to the vicinity of Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. After worshiping him, they returned to to Jerusalem with great joy. Last verse. And they were continually in the temple praising God. Yeah. So we don't do temple anymore, but let's say this is temple. Okay. We meet once a week. On average, it says most people don't get to church. They get to church less than two times per month. We read in Acts that when it says continually here, we read in Acts that they actually went to temple every day to praise the Lord. Every day. Because that was their life. That's what they did. Why? Because they had had an encounter with Jesus. And they knew him. And we see later that they get the promise. And they get the promise and all of a sudden they find their purpose. And they're like, our lives are abandoned. We have, we have to praise him. We have no choice. It's a response to who he is, not something that I do because I want to feel good about it. We're going to continue on. Mark 16. This is, we're going to start at verse 9. And this one kind of, this one actually kind of backs us up to where Luke started. So, We're actually backing up in time just a little bit. Early on the first day of the week, after he had risen, he appeared first, that's key, to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. Isn't that interesting? In a culture that that was completely male-driven, he appears first to a woman. And she had had seven demons. I wonder why he appeared first to her. I think... My guess would be because she knew what she had been set free from. That's what we were talking about the other day. In Luke, Luke 7, 47, it won't be up there. It says, therefore, I tell you her, her many sins is talking about, it might be the same Mary, it might be a different one, but her sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. If you know that you've been forgiven, we have all been forgiven much, whether you have a past or you don't, and we all have a past, but we've all been forgiven much. But if we don't recognize that we've been forgiven much, we won't love much. That preaches to me so strongly because I grew up in a church household. And so I have, to re- I have to realize, I have to recognize that even though I grew up in a church household and it, it's great, that's, that's the way we should grow up. But we also have to have that moment where we sit down and go, well, what was I saved from? I, I was saved from eternal torment. I was, because I sinned. I, I, I sinned. I still sin. But I sinned. I had to be set free from it. And without, without the sacrifice of Jesus, without his resurrection, without the ascension, I, I don't get to spend eternity with heaven, with him in heaven. And I don't get a purpose here. I might come up with one, but I don't, I don't really step into who I've been created to be. So we've got to recognize and know what we've been set free from. She went and reported to those who had been with him as they were mourning and weeping. You see that intimacy that she had, that she had a very intimate, close relationship with Jesus. And and that close friendship that she had with Jesus 
He appeared first to her, I believe, because she would believe with no question. He didn't have to prove it to her, she knew. Yet when they heard that he was alive and, and had been seen by her, they did not believe it. They did not believe it. After this, he appeared in a different form to two of them walking on their way into the country. So he gave, gave them Mary, then he gave them two more. And they went and reported it to the rest who did not believe them either. By the way, in Mark 16, right here, we're gonna see the word believe a lot. It's in there a lot and, and we're, uh, we'll read it before I get there. All right, here we go. Hanging on, because it gets real. By the way, this part right here, I believe this is the section that a lot of people think should not be in the Bible because they believe that it was written by someone other than Mark. And I would say, because I know God, that speaks to me even more why it should be there. Because God wanted it in his book. My God's big enough to say, you know what? Mark didn't write it down here, but this guy did. Let's put it in there. We'll give Mark the credit, but I need my people to know it. That's how big my God is. That's how big our God is. So I love, I, this is one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. Later, he appeared to the 11 themselves as they were reclining at the table. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who saw him after he had risen. Here's what's interesting. Reclining at the table. The last time Jesus was with the 11, they were all together, was at a table. So then he goes to the 11 again after he sent them two opportunities to believe. Where does he find them? At the table. And they're reclining at the table. No action. I want to make that clear. Because these other times that we've said they did not believe was a verb. They chose it was an action they did not believe. This one, when it says um, he rebuked their unbelief, that's a noun. He rebuked them as unbelief. They were unbelief. They weren't doing anything. They were just reclining at the table, mourning and weeping. He'd already given them two opportunities to believe. Now, I'm gonna pivot here for just a moment because they're reclining at the table. The last time they were together was at the table. We did setting the table for five or six weeks, right? And it's a discipleship initiative. But that whole setting the table is our preparation for our purpose and our calling. And so we're ending King Jesus today. We're gonna to move into another series. You don't wanna miss that series in two weeks. You do not wanna miss that series. It's one of, we're gonna be going through the book of Ruth. It's one of the most applicable books to the body of Christ today. You do not wanna miss that. And then right after that, we're gonna do around the table. And that's where we're gonna focus in on the conversations that Jesus, cause he had a lot of important conversations around a table. And so we've set the table. Now we're going to begin moving into life around the table. And our small groups this summer are going to be focused around that as well. So as a small groups pastor, selfish plug, please be considering be, uh, hosting and leading one of those small groups because it is discipleship. It is why we were here. And in the summertime, I know we all have places to go. We can work through that, but we need to make sure that the summertime isn't the time where we unplug, but we've got we've to dive in even more. And so we're gonna do that around the table. Then he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He just gave them their commission. We have the same commission today. And it says all creation. I'm sitting with Pastor John the other day. We're talking about this section. And he says, yeah, go, go tell a dog if you have to. I'm dead serious about that. And he was too. Action. If we believe that Jesus was crucified on a cross, that he died for our sins, that he was resurrected from the dead, and now he's ascended and sitting in heaven as king, and his presence lives inside of us, we should tell all of creation because all of creation is groaning for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. Creation is waiting for us to figure out who we are. That's true. So I realize that's a little bit of a joke, but man, if you've got nobody else, tell your pet. Let's, we gotta get in the habit. We gotta get in the habit of our living our lives every day for Jesus. Aaron's gotta get in the habit of living every day for Jesus. I'll, I'll make it personal. Cause I can go in Walmart and HEB and everywhere else with blinders on. I've, we've got, to, it's time. There, we're not, Jesus is waiting on us. All right. 
Where was that? 15. Sorry. Whoever believes, now it's a verb, and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes. If they should drink anything deadly, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will get well. Isn't it interesting? No one knew what we were doing today, but the staff sent that text about the healing today. It's one of the things specifically mentioned. Now I'm gonna present a question to you and it's gonna raise a lot of questions. Maybe, I don't know. I'm not saying that if we don't see signs and wonders accompanying us, following us closely, I'm not saying we're not saved, okay? Because it said, whoever believes will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. And if you believe, these signs will accompany you. That's what it says. Yes, everybody agree with me on that? Okay. So I'm not saying that if, if, if signs and wonders aren't accompanying you, that we're not saved. I'm just saying it's worth the investigation. It's worth finding out. What do we believe? And uh, listen, those signs, we do nothing. We do nothing. The times that I've seen the Holy Spirit move, I did and the rest of the people in the room did nothing. He did it all. It's just, we believed. In that moment we were believing. We just gotta believe. All right, so the Lord Jesus, after speaking to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. That's the most quoted, it's from Psalm 110, one, I think. That's the most quoted description from the Old Testament about Jesus, that he's seated at the right hand of God. Right hand being the place of power, and he's seated on a throne, he's king. He's king and he has all power. That's what he said, I have all power and authority in heaven and on earth. And then what did he say? As the Father sent me, now I send you. That's in John. And then verse 20, here's their response to his ascension. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the accompanying signs. You see, we see Jesus do lots of miracles. We see 27 in the Bible, but we know that in John it says, if all of them were recorded, not even all the books could hold them all. Okay? Okay. So, so he did a lot of miracles. And Jesus himself said, the miracles, the signs, they validate what I'm saying. He said, he said, if you don't believe the words, <clears throat> if you don't believe, sorry, my voice is going. If you don't believe the words that I say, at least believe the things that I do. That's what he said. So signs and wonder, it's not about the sign of the wonder. That's why we don't, that's why I'm, I'm adamant about, I don't, we don't need faith in healing. We need faith in the healer. We don't need faith for provision. We need faith in the provider and so on. All right, Acts chapter one. We're just gonna mow on through it. I'm not sure how much time I have, but again, they'll come up at 30 minutes and then I'll know. Acts 1, verse 3. After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While he was with them, he commanded, that's a key word, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which he said, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven and suddenly two men in white cloths, clothes, clothes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Why do you stand here looking into heaven? Because our friend who was dead, 
murdered, was alive, and we saw him do all kinds of things to include walking on water, and he just floated away. That's why we're staring into heaven. I find that hilarious. I promise you if I had been one, well, I'd have been freaked out because two guys just appeared, but if it would have just been normal, I'd have been like, how are you not standing there looking into heaven? I mean, <laughs> here's, why they, here's why I believe they asked that question. It's just my belief, but I believe they asked that question because they had their command. And in heaven, when the king gives a command, anywhere on the earth, when a king gives the command, the people move into action. They don't sit around. They don't watch your king go off in a chariot. They, don't, they go get to work. It's hard for us to comprehend in this culture because we don't have a king. We have president, government, all that other stuff, but we don't have, we don't have a king. But when the king says something, you do it. They had their command. Go to the city and wait. You wait for the promise. It's coming. I've already told you about this. And you got to have it. And when you get it, it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Why does the Holy Spirit empower us? It's not so we can do tricks. In fact, if that's the reason why we're doing it, it won't happen. If we're lucky. I won't go into that. It won't happen. So why are we empowered? Why do we get power of the Holy Spirit? To be his witnesses. What are we witnesses of? What Jesus has done in our life. What Jesus has done in the world. Who Jesus is. Here's the gospel. We were set apart from God because, we, we, because of sin. We were on the path to death because of sin. We've all fallen short. And the gospel is Jesus, God himself, came down as a man, lived his life as a man, anointed by the Holy Spirit. He was still God, fully God, 100% God, but did not consider himself equal to that in his life, okay? He was God, 100%. He never denied that. But he lived his life as a man, anointed by the Holy Spirit. And he went around doing good, healing all of those who were oppressed by the devil. So why are we empowered? Because our calling is the exact same as Jesus's. And that doesn't happen without the ascension. If Jesus said, if I don't go, he won't come. And it's better if he comes. Because if Jesus was still, on the world, uh, still in the world, we might be able to go see him. But because he's in heaven and he sent the Holy Spirit who can reside in all of us, now we have Jesus everywhere we go. Now we have the Father everywhere we go. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in us. That's what it says. The same power that created all of creation, the universe, the planets, the stars, the moons, everything, all the stuff we can't see with any help, all of it, that power, if you call Jesus Lord, resides inside of you. And I think he's sitting there going, wake up, I wanna do some cool stuff. And you'll find your purpose. You will find your calling. I mean, the world right now are people searching for their purpose in life, searching for their calling. And if we're honest, so are we. Meaning we're searching in the wrong places because we think sometimes things, activities, people, kids, that's where we find our purpose and our value. And there is purpose and value in all of those things, but it's not, it's not the purpose. It's not our, it's not the value that we have. The purpose and the value that we have is found in Christ and Christ alone. And we find that and we get that and we start walking in that by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You know, the, the most um, unattended service of any church 
is the prayer service. And for people who go to prayer services regularly, you can tell me if I'm wrong, guys. Some of you are out there. It's like one of the most fun things ever. I'm sorry. It's the most fun thing ever. And how many times here, you guys nodding heads, how many times you go to prayer meeting and you think, I don't know if I have time for this. Like, uh, it's on me again. You ever have that thought? I have that thought. I'm just being real. Like, I got to go to a prayer meeting. I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm busy. I've got things to do. The day is running by. I, okay, I'll go. And then you get there and you're like, oh, this is why I'm alive anyways. That's only found in the Holy Spirit. So here's the thing. I don't want this to be, I don't want this, I want it to be convicting. I, I'm convicted. I want it to be convicting, but I don't want it to be condemning any of what I've said. And here's what I mean by that. I don't want anyone to sit in the room and go, well, you know, you guys are praying for healing and I just, I don't know about that. Okay. You're talking about going to a prayer service and man, you know, prayer's always really boring to me. I mean, I, I pray, you know, sometimes, but I don't know. I don't know about that. Like, that seems, that seems like I'm not a good enough Christian. That's, what I'm, that's the point I'm trying to get to. I don't want any of this to sound like, and I don't know if it does or not, but I'm just covering my bases here. I don't want it to sound like I'm saying anyone is not a good enough Christian. Here's the, here's the encouraging part. Jesus died on the cross. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is now seated on his throne. He sent his Holy Spirit to be in all of us. And if we ever have those moments, those thoughts, or maybe we're living life right now going, Aaron, I don't, I don't, I don't get this. I don't, I don't know why you're so excited about this. Okay. You can have that. Here's the thing. The reason why I want to say it's not, I don't want it to be condemning is I don't, again, I don't want it to say, oh, you're not a good enough Christian. Here's the encouraging part. You just got to ask. You just got to pray. You just got to go in and get on your knees and pray, Lord, I need to know you better. I need to know, I need you. And I'll get rid of everything. Whatever you tell me to get rid of, I'll get rid of it. I just need you. I just need your Holy Spirit in my life because right now I'm having a hard time figuring out why I'm here. Today, I'm having a hard time. This is a daily thing, by the way. This has to be daily. And trust me when I say, if it's not daily, it will catch up to you. And you will have some bad days until you wake up and go, oh my gosh, I have not. I've gotten too busy. And so you go in and you get on your knees again. Father, I need you. I need you. See, Billy Graham got on his knees because he heard of a man that had an amazing world, world changing ministry who spent hours praying. How do you spend hours praying? Because it's, it's a relationship. It's Holy Spirit. It is Holy, it is a relationship. And relationships take time. Holy Spirit comes, boom, we can be off and running, but then we've got to go back and spend time. And Billy Graham saw that. And you know what he did? He just did this. He didn't know what else to do. I'm convinced of that. I don't think Billy Graham knew what else to do, but he knew his heart. And his heart was, God, I want everything that you have for me. Everything. I don't want you to miss one thing out. And I don't know what to do to get that. But I saw somebody who got it. I'm just going to do what they did. And it wasn't, an, it wasn't the action that did anything. It was a heart moved into action because of faith. No, I believe God has more for me. I believe that he will do in me more than I could ever dare to ask, think, imagine, hope. He would do more than that in me. I believe that. So what's the next step? Well, if I believe that, the next step has to be going to God and saying, God, I need more of you. We, we get the Holy Spirit without measure. Hear me, okay? But we, we need him in our lives flowing more and more. We need to be filled up and overflowing. 
And then tomorrow when we wake up, we need to be filled up and overflowing. And then the next day, filled up and overflowing. And how is that possible? Because God himself, God God himself said, my creation, I love them. And you guys need to hear this. He loves you. He loves you more than you could ever know. I love my creation. And I can't have a relationship with them the way that it is. So I need a sacrifice. I need someone to take the place and it has to be perfect or else it won't work. So I need someone to go down who can live a perfect life in their place and then take their place so that they can take his place because that's what happened. And Jesus, his son, I'll do it, dad. I got this. And it says he was tempted in every way. So he lived his life as a man. And he crawled up on the cross. And scripture says, anybody ever seen The Passion of the Christ? If you have not, go out, get it today, watch it. And that, that movie is almost accurate because I could, still, I could still tell that Jim Caviezel was a man. And scripture says, Jesus was beaten beyond that recognizable as a man. That's how bad it was. And you get in that movie and you're like, how, how could you ever, how could you go through that? How could you live through that? And yet it was worse It's just a picture. It was worse than that. And he carried that cross and then he climbed up on it and he paid it all in full. And because he was perfect, God says that sacrifice will do. And I'll apply it to everyone. Everyone that calls upon his name and believes him and follows him as Lord. I will apply his blood to them and I will see his perfection in them. Knowing that they are not, I will forget all of that and see them as perfect. And then he rose from the dead. And he went and he found his his peeps, found his people. And he said, we did this. Now go do this. And he left the earth so that the Holy Spirit could come and empower all of us. So for 2000 years, the Holy Spirit's been sent. Why? So that we have purpose. We have purpose. And God is giving us our purpose in the Holy Spirit. And your purpose is only found in that, in the Holy Spirit. And there's no one else that can get you there. We can help, we can, we can walk with you, we can pray, we can, we can do all kinds of things, but we can't get you to your purpose, which is becoming one with the Father through the Holy Spirit. If you would, please stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. We thank you for everything that was accomplished on the cross. We thank you that that he came, he died, he rose and he ascended so that your presence could live in us forever. Your presence could be with us and we could have access to you at all times. Father, I'm asking you right now for this reality to become reality in every person in this room, that we have your power, your presence living in us, that we have been given a purpose and a calling because of your mission. And our purpose and our calling is the exact same as yours. So Father, I ask that that your words today, that they reign true, that that anything spoken that was not of you falls to the floor, it is never more, but everything that you spoke reigns true and that it doesn't just stop right now, but it actually, it, it moves on. It moves on in time. I wanna say one more thing. We have, here, here's part of our reason and our, and our purpose. Church is awesome. Church is great. We do a lot of things. We've been doing a lot of things this semester. 
but a lot of organizations can do a lot of things. So we do things like today, there's gonna be a crawfish boil out here. Okay, go get your crawfish on, you know. There's other things and there's plenty. So if you need, if you didn't purchase already, go out there and you can, you can purchase it. We do small groups. Uh, we have serve teams. And in fact, uh, June 18th, we're gonna be doing a serve the city where declaration is actually out in the city serving. Listen, if not for the Holy Spirit, I'm probably out on most or all of those things. But because we have the Holy Spirit, now we get to go to a crawfish boil, we get to go to small group, we get to go to serve team, we get to go serve our city in the power and the anointing and the purpose of the Holy Spirit. And we get to touch people and it's very simple. Billy Graham spoke very simply, but the Holy Spirit moved through him. The Holy Spirit moves through us very simply, but very powerfully and it changes this area. And that moves on to change the world. That is why Jesus ascended. That is why he is King of Kings. He is seated on his throne. He is seated because it is done. It is finished. So we're gonna sing here in just a minute. We're gonna, we're gonna praise his name because he's worthy. And remember, worship is a response to who he is. So Father, we thank you for this day. We give you this day and we thank you for your presence and we give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen and amen. <laughs>